So this is Israel today as we see it, you guys, on the map. And uh, it's this little tiny, tiny nation right here surrounded by all kinds of enemies. And you can see in the Bible, it tells us who these enemies are. And we're going to be looking at that. So this is Israel during Solomon's reign. It was a bigger footprint, right? Look at this. About twice or maybe even three times the size of the land of Israel today. And that Solomon's kingdom was was like the greatest time for the, the kingdom of Israel. But this is all of the land that, that God promised Israel. This huge area from the Euphrates River way up here to like the border of Turkey. All through here, the whole coast, Syria, all this is going to belong to Israel. And then all the way to the the river, the Egyptian river, which some scholars say is the Nile River right here. Some are saying it's a smaller one over here. But this is a huge piece of land about the size of Texas. And this is what God promised Israel. And they're going to get it. Because why? Because God promised it. That's why. There's no debating it. So during the millennial reign of Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, right? Jesus the Messiah. This is the land that Israel will be, this huge area. And we're going to be looking at that in this episode. So a long time ago, right? I like to do this because it just it's kind of cool, right? A long time ago. Here's the world. This is the world as we see it here. And we're zeroing in on this area right here, the land of Israel, right? Particularly Jerusalem. Here we are getting closer to what we're going to be looking at. This guy right here, this evil emperor of the Roman Empire named Hadrian, around 136 AD, changed the name, that's 136 years after the birth of Jesus Christ. Because Anno Domini is what AD means, not after death. Anno Domini means the year of our Lord, the very first Christmas when Jesus was born. So 136 years later, this guy, Hadrian, changed the name of the province of Judea to Palestina in an attempt to erase its Jewish past, right? In other words, he wanted to do what? Wipe Israel off of the map. Who else says that? Yeah, the protesters that say from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Who named it Palestine? That evil guy, that evil emperor of the Roman Empire, who was very anti-Semitic, very anti-Jewish, anti-Israel, anti-God. And he's the one who wiped Israel off of the map. Now, a lot of Christians think that God has nothing to do with the nation of Israel, and they're doing that in their own hearts, and it's wrong. It's wrong. I think God wants you Christians to realize that he has a plan with Israel. So stop being that way. Stop being evil. All right. So what happened? The, the Jewish people were spread to the four corners of the world because he sold them as slaves throughout all of the land. And then what happened almost 2,000 years later, a great miracle happened. And what was that? Israel was born. And here it is in Ezekiel 36. It was predicted. It was foretold by God through the prophet Ezekiel. For I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the lands, and I will bring you into your own land. So here's a timeline that we can look at that shows us exactly What's going on here? So in the beginning, God, in the end, God, there was creation right here. I think God's outside of time, by the way. But everything points to Jesus. I know this is the Roman Gregorian calendar, but this is what the world has been using. And it all points to Jesus, you guys. So creation, we don't know when that was. We don't know when the flood was. We know Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are around like 2,500 to twenty to 2,000 BC, which does mean before Christ. And then we keep going. We see Moses right around the 1400 BC, Joshua, David around 1000 BC. And we're getting pretty accurate there. And then Elijah around 700. And then from 600 to 500 BC, we see Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, uh, Micah, Malachi, you know, all those, those prophets. And then there was 400 years of silence from no, no word from the Lord. And then the birth of Jesus, and God started speaking through the through prophecy again. And Jesus was born, Yeshua HaMashiach, if you're in Israel. And then in 32 AD, he was 33 years old. You don't count the zero here. He was 33 years old, and he died on the cross. But then, three days later, he's raised from the dead, and he's alive today, you guys. 
And Paul saw him on the road to Damascus. Paul, who was a Pharisee, the Pharisee of Pharisees, and he was converted. He gave his life to Jesus. He surrendered to him, and he became one of the greatest Christians ever. And then later, around 70 AD, the temple was destroyed by the Romans, by Titus, General Titus and his Roman legions, and they destroyed the temple, just as Jesus said that would happen, and it it hurt him. He cried over Jerusalem. And not one stone remained upon another. They destroyed the entire temple, threw the stones down. You can still see evidence of that today in Jerusalem. And then in 95 AD, John on the island of Patmos uh, wrote the book of Revelation. He had the vision of the last book of the Bible, and the Bible was sealed. It was done being written, but not everything in it has been fulfilled. And then in 1948, we saw this miraculous birth of the nation of Israel again. And that's why people get excited about that, because it's... It's pointing to what's going to happen, you guys, that God, that Jesus is going to be returning. So here it is again. This is a closer look at the timeline. And we're looking at 2020, well, it's 2024 now as we're recording this. And the Jewish people in Israel have everything ready to build the temple on the Temple Mount. Isn't that amazing? So what's going on here? So Israel returns in Ezekiel 36 and 37. They return. Israel returns from the four corners of the world, you guys. The nation was born again. In Ezekiel 37, God says, Son of man, can these bones live? So there's like a valley of, of just dry bones everywhere. Ezekiel sees this valley of dry bones. And God says, can these bones live? What does Ezekiel say? And I answered, Lord God, you yourself know. Good answer, Ezekiel. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. You know, Lord. Tell me. <laughs> and then he, and then it continues. Behold, I'm going to make breath enter you so that you may come to life, God says. Isn't that amazing? So in 1948, Israel was rebirthed. And we see the fulfillment of, of chapters 36 and 37. And some people say, oh, well, no, that was, that was the return from exile. No, it wasn't, you guys. You know why? It wasn't the return from Babylon because they were united, Israel. The, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, Israel and Judah, were one stick in God's hand. In other words, he says it in those chapters that there is a united Israel. They will no longer be divided. God made it very clear in this. So here we are. He says, Son of man, these are the bones. These are the entire house of Israel. I will bring you into the land of Israel. And so God did that. God brought them back in 1948, and they're there now, right now, you guys right there in the land of Israel. God watches everything, and he has a plan. So there's Israel today, that little tiny sliver of a country that's about the size of New Jersey. And then what happens after 36 and 37, when Israel comes back to the land, then this war is going to happen. You may have heard of this, Ezekiel 38 and 39. Some people call it the, the War of Gog and Magog. Now, Gog is just the title. He's the prince, the chief, the the leader of Magog and this this big army. Some people have speculated that it could be Putin. I don't know. I don't know who it is. I don't know if it's happening now yet, but it's going to happen. And, and nowhere in history has this war ever happened. That's why it's a future event. So here we are looking at it. These are the countries, Gomer, Persia, which is Iran. Everybody knows that. Historically, this is Iran. And we see Magog. Now, Magog is the land north of the Caspian Mountains, which is includes Russia and some other countries, right? And then Iran, these are the two main elements of this army. And guess what, guys? These two are working today. They are working together today against Israel. Isn't that amazing? Who knows? It could happen in our lifetime, you guys. So Ezekiel 38 says, Behold, I am against you, Gog, this leader of this, this evil army, right? He says, I'm against you, Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. So here we are. Here's the uh, Meshach and Tubal could be the area of Turkey. Some people say that Erdogan could be the Antichrist. Um, you know, and then there's there's Gog and Magog up here. So there's a little map reference again for you. And then Ezekiel 38 says this, Persia, Cush. 
and put. Now, Cush and put would be down in Africa, would be the area of Libya, Algeria, and Ethiopia, Sudan, parts of Ethiopia. So all of these people are coming against Israel with them, all of them with buckler and helmet, Gomer with all of his troops. And they're coming against who? Israel, God's chosen people, the apple of his eye, Israel. And Ezekiel 38 continues, and after many days, you will be summoned in the latter years. Very important right here, you guys, the latter years. And you will come down to the land that is restored from the sword. That would be Israel, you guys. The Romans destroyed Israel with a sword. So did the Ottoman Turks. And um, it was just, there was horrible times for them. And then it continues, and and have been gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which have been a continual place of ruins. Mark Twain himself talked about Israel when he visited back in the 1800s about just a place of ruins and desolate. There's just nothing there, a cursed land. Well, when Israel came back, when the P Jewish people came back, guess what? It's beautiful. God's blessed it again. It's thriving. Their economy's thriving. They have lush gardens and, and agriculture and, and business. And God's just been blessing them, you guys. So here it says that um, it's been a place of ruins in Ezekiel 38. But its people were brought out from the nations, God says, and they are living securely, all of them. Right? And you will go up and you will come down like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land. That's exactly what just massive amounts of people look like from space, from the sky. It looks like a cloud, right? You and all of your troops and many peoples with you, God says. So it would be this army right here coming down from the north. What's interesting today, actually, that in Syria, which is north of Israel around the Golan Heights in Syria. Russia has a base there right now, and so does uh, Iran. They've had bases there. Israel's been bombing them because of that. And now Turkey's starting to get involved too, and they're part of this whole army, right? So it's just really interesting, you guys. So let's continue on in this. You will come down from your place out of the remote parts of the north, and you and many peoples with you. So let's go back to this. What's the remote parts of the north? That's the land of Magog, you guys, and all this from the land of Israel. That's where they're going to be attacking from. And then it continues in Ezekiel 38, and you will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. So there's going to be massive amounts of people of soldiers and it shall come about in the last days that i will bring you against my land so god's drawing them in because it was already in their hearts to do this but god's like oh yeah come on so that the nations may know me when i show myself holy through you before their eyes gog god specifically talking to this leader here but he's saying that all the nations are going to know this is why i'm doing it why i'm allowing it right so every man's sword will be against his brother with plague and with blood. I will enter into judgment against him. Now we just did an episode. I just did an episode. You might want to check it out on how the story of Moses, Jesus and Moses show Moses story shows the book of Revelation. It shows it because there's all those plagues. Seven of those 10 plagues are in the book of Revelation. And God gave us a picture so we can understand how it will all come down, how it will take place. So let's continue on in this. So God turns their sword against them. It, they're going to turn against each other, right? And I will rain on him and on his troops and on the many peoples who are with him. Here it is. A torrential rain, hailstones, fire, and brimstone. This is... God doing it. This is not Israel with their nukes, you know, and their great army that they have doing it. This is actually God, and the whole world's going to know it. It is going to be powerful, you guys. There's a giant hillstone right here, and these things kill cattle and people, and it will definitely kill an army. And here's the fire and brimstone that God, I believe, is going to bring down. It says right there in the scripture, he's going to bring down against this army. So I will prove myself great, show myself holy. So God's showing the, the world that he is God and make myself known in the sight of many nations. The world's going to know it was him who did this. And they will know that I am the Lord, God says. Isn't that amazing, you guys? Wow. So here's a, a BC before Christ. 
Ezekiel wrote this right around the same time as Daniel. It was like 600 to 500 before Christ. He wrote this down. So that's like 2,500 years um, you know, before what's happening now in the land of Israel. So here's Israel during Solomon's reign. That was right around 1,000 to 967, I think it was, B.C., about 900 years before Christ. And he had this big footprint of land, right? Here's Israel today, this red outline. It's just that little sliver. And Solomon's reign in all its glory, the glory, most glorious time of Israel was this footprint. Now watch this. This is what his temple looked like. They had paving stones of silver. Isn't that amazing? I'll put the full picture on there so you can see it all. There was paving stones of silver. There was like seven menorahs in the temple. It was just a glorious temple, and God filled it too. Here's the timeline again. So Solomon's temple was right around here, um, and uh, that's where we see in the, in the timeline on that. So the church age is what we're in now. They call it the age of grace as well. But this will end, and I believe it ends when God catches us up just as his bride to be with Jesus, and then he deals with the world and he saves Israel. And that's what we're about to see, you guys, in these scriptures. It's amazing. So here's the land that God promised Israel from the Euphrates River right here all the way down this coast to the river in Egypt. Israel is going to own all of this land. It hasn't happened yet. It didn't happen in Solomon's reign. Now let's move into Ezekiel 40. This is after the Gog and the Magog War, right? So we're seeing something new here, you guys. So he says, Son of man, see with your eyes, hear with your ears, and pay attention to all that I am going to show you. So God's saying this is very important. For you have been brought here in order to show to you, declare to the house of Israel all that you see, God says to Ezekiel. Then he went to the gate which faced Israel. East. Now, there's a big focus on this east gate all through chapter 40, all the way to the end of Ezekiel in chapter 48. You're going to see this east gate brought up over and over by God. Its porches were toward the outer court, and palm tree decorations were on its side pillars, and its stairway had eight steps. So it's beautifully decorated. God's into beautiful things, you guys. The first temple, even the tabernacle, was a beautiful place. God decorated it magnificently, and He's gonna, this new temple is going to be even more amazing in Ezekiel. It's, I can't wait to see it. But here God says there's going to be palm trees carved into this east gate uh, porch, the, the entrance to it. So here we see Ezekiel 41, and it was carved with cherubim and palm trees. It's going to be so glorious, is it not? And then in Ezekiel 43, then it says, Then he led me to the gate, the gate facing east. And behold, the glory of God, the God of Israel, was coming from the way of the east. Now, who would that be? That would be Jesus, you guys. Jesus, right? Because he came down from the Mount of Olives, right? He came down on that donkey from the Mount of Olives, and he entered that east gate as everyone was proclaiming, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And, and he, they worshiped him and, and, and threw palm branches down. And then what happened? A few days later, they crucified him. But that was all in fulfillment of the scriptures. So you can't be angry at the Jewish people. That would be wrong because Jesus came down purposely, came down to die on the cross. This was God's plan. And it was the Romans. It was the world that put him up on that cross. But it was actually, it was God himself that did it. He did it. He came to die on the cross. So there shouldn't be any anti-Semitic stuff there at all from anybody. So then in Ezekiel 43, then he led me to the gate. So this is over and over about this east gate. The gate facing east and behold the glory of God of Israel was coming from the way of the east. So he's seeing a vision, I believe, of Jesus here. So here's what it looked like during Herod's time, the Mount of Olives being over here. Jesus came down the Mount of Olives, and here's the Kidron Valley and the Kidron Brook. And then I believe there was a there was a little bridge here possibly, and he came over into the Golden Gate or the East Gate back then, which was a little bit north of the temple. And he came in and people were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So this is what it looked like during Herod's time. Herod's temple was right here. And I believe that Solomon's temple was originally north of that over here because the Dome of the Rock is over this right now. But was that where 
Solomon's temple was? I don't think so. There's this Dome of the Spirits or the Dome of the Tablets over here, and it lines up with the original East Gate, and I believe that's where Solomon's temple was because this could have been the, the Holy of Holies. It's this flat bedrock place. So here's how the, the Golden Gate, as you can see it today, this was actually rebuilt by the Ottoman Turks right around 1517 AD, okay? 1517 AD, right around the Reformation, actually. And um, and this evil guy named Solomon the Magnificent had it sealed shut because he heard a Jewish uh, rabbi say that this is a beautiful gate you built and our Messiah will enter by it. And he was like, oh, no, no Jewish Messiah is going to enter by my gate. So he had it sealed shut with brick. But what did he do when he did that? Did you know that he fulfilled scripture? You're about to see that. Watch this. In Ezekiel, this is what it looks like today. It lines right up. Here's that Dome of the Spirits or Dome of the Tablets. It's over some flat bedrock right there, which I believe was where Solomon's temple was. So watch this. Here it is. There's no chisel marks in this flat space, which is about 12 by 12, 12 foot diameter. Um, and it's plenty big enough for the Ark of the Covenant to sit on, which could have been the Holy of Holies, because they call it the Dome of the Tablets. What was in the Ark of the Covenant? The tablets that Moses carried, right, that God wrote with his finger. So here's another line from the Mount of Olives through the original East Gate. They found these two pillars underneath the Golden Gate, which they think was Solomon's. Here's where Solomon's porch would have been. You read about that in Acts, in the book of Acts, right? And this is where Herod's temple was, right where the Dome of the Rock is today. But I think Solomon's temple was north of it. And then this straight line actually points all the way to Golgotha, which is really interesting. So <laughs> let's continue in this. So Ezekiel 43, and his voice is like the sound of many waters, and the earth um, uh, shook from his voice, I believe it said. In Ezekiel 43, it says, He brought me back by the way of the outer gate of the sanctuary, which faces east, and it was shut. So that guy fulfilled scripture. He fulfilled, because it says, And the Lord said to me, This is the gate. This gate shall be shut. It shall be not be opened, and no one shall enter by it. What gate? That east gate that Jesus went through. For the Lord God of Israel has entered by it, therefore it shall be shut. He repeats that over and over and over. So Solomon the Magnificent fulfilled scripture by sealing up that east gate when he rebuilt the, the walls of Jerusalem. And then Ezekiel 43 continues, And then he brought me by way of the north gate to the front of the house, and I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord, and I fell on my face. And then he says, And the Lord said to me, Son of man, pay attention. See with your eyes and hear with your ears. Everything that I say to you concerning all the statutes of the house of the Lord and all of its laws... Pay attention to the entrance of the house with its exits of the sanctuary. So God's saying specifically, pay attention to these entrances and these exits, right? This is what the Lord God says. The gate of the inner courtyard facing east shall be shut for six working days. But it shall be opened on the Sabbath day and open on the day of the new moon. Isn't that amazing? So here's a drawing I did of this new, these new walls and gates and entrances and exits. And the temple would be right in this area right here. And it's in Ezekiel 48. And he gives us a description of it right here. It says, these gates, these shall be the gates of the city named for the tribes of Israel. So the original sons of Jacob, sons of Israel, these are their names on each of these gates, these entrances and these exits. And Ezekiel 48 continues, three gates toward the north, the gate of Reuben, one, the gate of Judah, one, and the gate of Levi, one. So here we have Reuben, Judah right in the center on the north side, and Levi. These are the gates that we see. And this is the north, right? So you're going to see something amazing here. Three gates toward the north, the gate of Reuben, the gate of Judah, and the gate of Levi. So here we go. Watch this. Then he brought me back to the door of the house, and behold, the water was flowing from under the threshold of the house toward the east. So here it is again. There's water coming from 
the the house is the temple, right? And it's south of the altar and it's flowing like this. Now watch this. You're going to see something amazing. And Ezekiel 46 continues and it says, And the water was flowing down from, uh, from under, from the, the right side of the house, from the south of the altar. South of the altar. And he brought me out by the way of the north gate and led me around on the outside of the outer gate by way facing east. So what does Ezekiel do? He came out right here, this north gate, which is Levi gate. He was a Levite, by the way. He was a priest and a prophet. And he comes over here and he sees this gate. Now watch this. It's this exciting, guys. And behold, water was spurting out from the south side. What was coming out of the side of Jesus? Water mixed with blood, right? Out of the south side because he was facing east when he was on that cross. That's where traditional Golgotha was, you guys. And the water was coming out of his side on the south side. Ezekiel 46 continues, And behold, water was spurting out from the south side. Now here it is again, you guys. There's a straight line from the Mount of Olives through the Golden Gate, the original East Gate, where Solomon's temple was, north of Herod's temple. And then it goes straight to Golgotha. It's a straight line, you guys. Isn't that amazing? And God was showing this to us. And here in Zechariah 12, 10, it says, And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced, Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Here it is again. Straight line to Golgotha through the Golden Gate, which is the East Gate was originally under there, through the Dome of the Tablets, which I believe was the Holy of Holies. And out of the south side of Jesus flowed this water mixed with blood. Ezekiel chapter 48 says again, the city walls and gates, here we are, and whose name is on this east gate right here, this northeast gate that Ezekiel walks out from the north, and he comes around here and he sees this gate, the gate that faces east, and Joseph's name is on there. That's amazing, you guys. You know why? Because Joseph was a huge picture and a portrait, a type of Jesus Christ. I did episodes on that you can look at, and you'll be blown away by how similar Joseph's life was to Jesus. He had a Gentile bride. He was rejected by his own right, sold for pieces of silver, sent down to that place of the condemned. There was two with him, one, the baker, right? He He's cursed forever. And then the cupbearer, he lives. He's given life, like the two on the cross with Jesus. And then he was raised up out of that place of the dead. And, he, and that condemned, and he was brought before the throne. He was the only one found worthy to reveal God's plan, his future plan, just like Jesus taking the scrolls out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And then he was given, what, a Gentile bride. Then later, during a seven-year time of great trouble, Israel comes back to him, bow down. He forgives them. He forgives them and saves them. And blesses them with the best of the land. This is a picture of Jesus, you guys. That's why I believe Joseph's name is right there on that east gate in the new temple that Ezekiel describes. Isn't that amazing, you guys? God is so good that he did this. This blows my mind. Wow. Good stuff, guys. So, Ezekiel 48.35 says, The name of the city from that day shall be the Lord is there. That's the name of the city. The Lord is there. Look at that. Isn't that awesome? Hey, my friend, if you have never, um, if you haven't subscribed yet and you would like to subscribe to this channel, you can just hit that button down below and the bell too and you won't miss anything. And... Um, and I, you know, you're just going to be blessed, I think, by by everything that this channel can offer, which is how using the whole Bible, right, holistically, the whole Bible to see and understand God's plan, to know Him. A lot of people say, "Don't make an idol out of the Word of God or the Bible." It, these are His words. That's a really strange thing to say. These are God's words. How do you get? And they say it's all about relationship. Well, how do you get to have relationship? You relationship about is about knowing somebody, listening to them. How do you listen to God? Read your Bible. You might be saying, "Well, I want to hear His voice." Then read it out loud. <laughs> read the Bible, you guys. And that's why this channel is all about the whole Bible, the whole counsel of God, like Paul said. 
And when we understand the whole Bible, like Joseph's story and Moses' story, you could understand books like Revelation, which most pastors don't even go into. So if you'd like to see more, click on this playlist right here, and you can look at Joseph and how he was a type of Christ. I think there was like 17 episodes that you could look at it in detail. So click on this playlist right here, my friend.